Coming up on Global Business, Brazilian President Lula da Silva set to arrive in China later today for a four-day state visit amid a strengthening bilateral ties. We are on the ground at the third Hainan Expo and our focus today is the rise of green consumption in China. And China's top energy officials explain the country's energy strategy amid growing demand and transitioning towards carbon neutrality. From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is Global Business. I'm Lili Lu. Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva is set to arrive in China later today for a state visit. Accompanied by a delegation of business leaders, governors, senators, deputies and ministers, Lula is expected to close several bilateral agreements between the two countries during this trip. The visit begins on Thursday in Shanghai. Chinese President Xi Jinping is expected to receive President Lula at an official ceremony later this week. And our reporter Chen Tong is at the Shanghai Hongqiao Airport. Hi there, Chen Tong. What's the latest? Yes, Lula is expected to arrive here at the Shanghai Hongqiao Airport in about one and a half hours. And as you mentioned, a busy schedule for him tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, he will be attending the inauguration ceremony for the new president of the new development bank, which headquartered here in Shanghai's Pudong New Area. And the new president of the bank is actually the former president of Brazil, Dilma Rousseff. And tomorrow afternoon, he's going to visit a Huawei Innovation Center here in Shanghai and also meet some Brazilian entrepreneurs here and then had to uh, have to Beijing tomorrow evening. Well, it will be the fifth time for Lula to come to China. His first time was in 2001, when he was the honorary president of the Workers' Party in Brazil. And then he came to China three times as the president of Brazil. Well, earlier, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of, of Brazil uh, said uh, this time they are, the dedication team of uh, Lula is actually over 200 members, and most of them are entrepreneurs. And the two countries are expected to sign some 20 agreements, including in industries such as healthcare, education, agriculture, and finance. And also, uh, the leaders of the two countries are also expected to talk about the Ukraine uh, crisis. And Lula also earlier, also earlier told the media that uh, he would like to invite Chinese President Xi Jinping to visit Brazil and show him some of the projects uh, Lula hopes to see more Chinese invest investments. China has been Brazil's largest trading partner for almost 14 years, and uh, one-third of Brazil Brazil's exports actually go to China, and just last month, the two countries signed a deal to dish U.S. dollar in favor of using their own currencies in trade transactions. So all of these are actually showing uh, how determined these two BRICS nations, these two emerging economies, are expected to promote their mutual benefits. And of course, my colleagues will be covering tomorrow's uh, event and bring you the latest. Back to you. Great stuff. Thank you very much. That's a correspondent Chen Tong at the Shanghai Hongqiao Airport for us. China and Brazil, one as the world's most populated country and the other a major food producer, are extremely close in the field of agriculture. As Brazil's government data showed, about one-third of the country's farm goods exports last year were shipped to China, and that is worth nearly 51 billion U.S. dollars, a 43 percent surge compared with 2021. In the past few years, China has become the top buyer of Brazil's soybeans, chicken and sugar. And besides these items, Chinese consumers also love coffee beans, orange juice, corn and other meats from Brazil. China is already Brazil's main buyer of agricultural products, but Brazil would still like to expand its export products. Our correspondent Paulo Cabral has more from the Brazilian state of Rio Grande do Norte. The scannery melon being plucked off the ground in Brazil's northeastern state of Rio Grande do Norte is bound for a long journey all the way around the globe to customers in China. After a couple test runs last year to close contracts and study logistics, this large farm is now preparing to ship high volumes of its fruit to the Chinese market. We are projecting that in the 2023 harvest, we will export between 100 and 200 containers per week to the Chinese market, not counting other Asian markets that are also interested in our products. Now the company is working on licenses to also begin exporting watermelons to China, a more delicate and perishable melon variety. It's very gratifying to be working to pick a fruit that will be shipped out of the country. 
to feed other peoples in other cultures. The farm's manager says logistics is the biggest hurdle in increasing exports to China. We have many fruits in our country and here in our region, like mango, watermelon, banana, papaya, and exports have been increasing year after year. And with fruit exports, the big challenge is to get the products quickly to the final customers. So we need policies and measures to improve our logistics. Rio Grande do Norte has ambitious plans to expand its trade with China, but for that, the state needs to increase its port capacity. Despite Rio Grande do Norte's favorable geographical location, it's the shortest Atlantic crossing between South America and Africa. The state's main port has berths for only three vessels, and the bridge right at the canal's entrance limits their size. The state secretary says talks are already underway with one of China's biggest engineering firms on construction of a new port and hopes President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva's visit to China will help cement the project. It will be a multi-purpose port. We could export our iron ore there. We have proven reserves of 600 million tons of iron ore. We also produce much salt and we are exporting only half of it, simply for not having a better port. And also our traditional products such as fruits like melon. China has just lifted a one-month ban on Brazilian beef tied to an isolated case of mad cow disease. For the foreseeable future, some key commodities like beef and soy are likely to be the main exports to China. But diversification could help ease the negative impacts when problems arise with any one product. Now let's get more insights on the economic ties between China and Brazil. For that, we're bringing our guest, Mr. Liu Baochun, Dean for the Center of, of International Business Ethics at UIBE in Beijing. Mr. Liu, so smart agriculture and agriculture-related technologies are areas in which the two countries can look at extensive cooperation. What are your views on that, and what is the current status of cooperation between the two sides? Well, uh, both of these countries are on the top five uh, list of uh, a big agriculture uh, development, and uh, uh, they have so much in common uh, and also in complementarity in terms of the uh, further development for the potential of agricultural uh, cooperation. Uh, one is that uh, you know the uh, Brazil has a large land that can be further developed. Uh, with the uh, rich soil, and, uh, and now uh, they also have a uh, uh, good harvest, but uh, it must be managed under a uh, more intelligent system. And uh, uh, more importantly, I think, you know, as the previous uh, uh, interviewee mentioned, that uh, they are short of uh, the uh, infrastructure development for storage capacity, for shipping roads, and uh, now China can really come uh, into further cooperation with uh, its aggressive uh, uh, outbound investment and also uh, the rising demand for uh, from home. So therefore, now when China is uh, uh, leading uh, in many parts for the uh, artificial intelligence in terms of the drones, in terms of the control of irrigation, weather forecasts, etc., that can really largely be shared between these two countries for. Uh, enlarged area of cooperation uh, to look after the harvest and also to uh, cater to the rising demand uh, from both supply and also the demand from the Chinese side. Uh, Mr. Liu, this time on this trip, uh, President Lula is accompanied by a large business delegation. Within that, about 90 of them are agricultural business delegates, and some of them arriving before their president do, uh, does. What are the likely areas of cooperation with Chinese enterprises? Well, uh, you know, uh, to uh, further uh, erase productivity in the agriculture through the, inter the introduction of uh, the uh, inputs uh, improvement, in, including seeds, fertilizer, pesticides, machineries, uh, uh, in which China uh, has a uh, also quite an advantage. And the other is to uh, look for uh, investment opportunities from China to improve their logistics, from uh, you know building storage capacities or even improving their poor roads, 
and enlarge the ports that can really be uh, shipped uh, at a lower cost and at, at a higher speed to China, and uh, then you know to uh, acquire some of the uh, interest uh, in terms of uh, a new technology, new farming technologies, new artificial intelligence, and uh, uh, data that can also be shared uh, for uh, Brazil. And also they are there to ensure that it, uh, we are going to have a more uh, the consistent strategy over the disease prevention and uh, in terms of quality control and a quarantine uh, inspection. So uh, these are really very much eager to look up to China to uh, give them quite a push and also support for their agricultural development and particularly for those uh, farmers. Oh, great stuff. Thank you so much. That's all the time we have for today. That's Ms. Liu Baotun from UIB for us. Well, Brazil, as we know, it is a global powerhouse in food and agricultural exports. It has always been an enigma for food enthusiasts from all over the world. And here in Beijing, the first Brazilian restaurant, Casa Asai, opened last year, bringing authentic cuisine from the Latin American country. Our reporter Olivier He has more. Here in Beijing, there is a place to experience authentic Brazilian food and culture. And now we're heading to the second Gaza Sai restaurant. When you walk into the restaurant, you'll see all kinds of yellow and green patterned Brazilian style elements. There are chefs preparing food for dinner, and you hear people speaking Portuguese too. The owner of the restaurant was born in China's Taiwan and moved to Brazil in 1985. In order to let people in Beijing taste the delicacies of his second hometown, he opened the first Brazilian dining restaurant here. In the 1980s, after traveling around South America, I was deeply attracted by the culture of Brazil and finally chose to settle there. Now, coming back to my own country, I'm dedicated to improving friendship between the two nations, bringing Brazilian cuisine and culture to China and making Brazilians in Beijing feel at home. Zhu Weidong says the name of the restaurant comes from the acai berry, a superfood ranked as one of the healthiest fruits in the world, but not too well known in China. After the acai is picked from the tree, it has to be processed within 24 hours. We have developed the acai bowl, which contains pure acai berry and banana and guarana. Our customers like it as it is not only delicious, but also good for the skin. In addition to acai, Brazilian national dishes such as feijoada, cheese bread bowls and guarana drinks are available at the restaurant. Gaza Sai for me feels like home. I come with my Brazilian friends almost every weekend. Though I have never been to Brazil, I can feel the passionate atmosphere of the country. The restaurant owner likes to introduce the culture behind each dish and always gives items with Brazilian characteristics for free. Zhu Weizhong says that his main motivation to run the business is to introduce good things to people and promote cultural bilateral exchanges between the two countries. The Brazilian Food Association's Beijing presentation was held at this store last week, with the top five Brazilian food companies and Chinese food importers showcasing and sampling Brazilian cuisine. To give Brazilian food a bigger stage in China, since 2012, Zhu Weizhong has served as the organizer and representative of Brazil in China International Fair for Trading Services, which has facilitated trade exchanges between the two countries and made important contributions to economic and trade cooperation between China and Brazil. Olivia He, CGTN, Beijing. And still to come here on Global Business. We are on the ground at the third Thailand Expo, and our focus today is the rise of green consumption in China. The China International Consumer Products Expo is back for its third edition. Over 3,000 of the world's top brands converge in Haiko to showcase a full spectrum of high quality products and services. Spotlighting the hottest trends and energizing China's supersized consumer market. Nous allons voir ce que c'est fait aussi pouvoir d'achat qui concerne 1,4 milliard de consommateurs signifie pour les entreprises et les marques. Únase a nosotros en Haiko para nuestra cobertura especial de este evento.
and discover new exciting opportunities from China opening wider to the world. Only on CGTN. Well, at this year's Hainan Expo, several attendees are showcasing their latest environment-friendly products and solutions. Our reporter Wang Tianyu is on the ground for a closer look. Carbon emissions are everywhere, from charging my phone, making this reporter pass, from my cameraman's video shots, and even taking this elevator. And even when we are watching this video, the carbon emissions are being generated. Today, as the world realizes how greenhouse gases could change our climate, Environmental protection has become a global topic and priority. In this year's China's International Consumer Products Expo, known as Hainan Expo, attendees have brought up solutions to save energy. The mobile convenience store solution can help us avoid the waste generated by the frequent opening and closing of stores. With this kind of truck, you can sell wherever you drive to. Besides, this vehicle is an electric vehicle. It's energy efficient and good for the environment. Well, in the industrial sector, energy can not only be saved from production, but also in machines' maintenance. Like here, this cleaning robot can make the already environmental-friendly solar panels more sustainable. Photovoltaic panels that have not been cleaned for a while will reduce the power generation by 20 to 30 percent. That's why cleaning is necessary. To clean uh, photovoltaic panels are the size of four football courts, this machine can easily finish the cleaning in eight hours, while in terms of uh, human cleaning, it will cost at least a week. It will approximately uh, save uh, one third of the uh, water consumption compared to current human cleaning. Yeah. As China has committed to reach carbon peak by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060, more green development leading to positive impact will be seen in this country. Wang Tianyu, CGTN, Haikou, Hainan Province. And this year, the Hainan Expo is embarking on the next stage of its green journey by making all the venues carbon-free. That's the first time in the event's three-year history. Take a look. Making all the exhibition venues carbon-free. That means an area of about 17 football fields is using electricity only from renewable energy sources. It'll cut the equivalent amount of more than 1,300 tons of carbon dioxide emissions. But this is not the first time for the expo to promote green and low-carbon ways of consumption. Green consumption has been one of the key themes at the Hainan Expo since its debut in 2021. Green consumers are demanding green products, which in turn is creating demand for green manufacturing and sustainable business practices. Companies from all over the world that are gathering in Hainan every year are well aware of these facts. And that's why you're guaranteed to see green packaging, digital supply chains, energy-saving technologies, and more at this year's Hainan Expo. And to further deepen the reform and opening up strategy, in April 2018, China announced a plan to turn Hainan into a free trade pilot zone and free trade port. And over the past five years, preferential policies such as zero tariffs and low tax rates have prompted more and more enterprises to set up shops on the island. Lin Wu has the story. As of today, more than 180 policies have been put into effect in Hainan, attracting enterprises and investors. As an artificial intelligence solution service provider, China AI took only three days to complete the registration process in Hainan and swears by the efficient and professional services of the free trade port. We see the great policies and talents advantages of being in Hainan, including the 15% cap on corporate and personal income taxes which are attractive to overseas talent. The scientists in our group are from all over the world. Reduced taxes can save costs for us, enhancing international competitiveness. In the past five years, the Fuxing Industrial Park has brought in 5,000 new domestic enterprises and over 300 foreign enterprises from 22 countries and regions. These enterprises generated revenue of 140 billion yuan and tax revenue of 7.5 billion yuan in 2022. Digital economy enterprises accounted for over 40 percent of the province's total revenue. 
We have arranged a civil staff to solve problems of enterprises, provide suggestions for their development at various stages, and find ways to leverage the advantages of RCEP and DEPA and encourage process imports and exports, trading services, offshore trade and more. In 2022, Hainan added 963,300 new market entities, an increase of 96.79 percent. As of December last year, the province's existing market entities approached 2.4 million, an increase of 50.14 percent, and the growth rate has remained first in the country for 34 consecutive months. This means that in 2022, an average of about 2,639 market entities were added per day in Hainan. Lin Wu, Sunshine Satellite TV in Hainan for CGTN. Consumption will continue to be the mainstay of economic growth in China and the rest of Asia this year. That is according to the Economic Outlook report released by the Asian Development Bank. Our reporter Olivia He spoke to the head of the Economics and Strategy Unit of the ADB in China to understand how consumption recovery can help the country achieve high growth rates. The ADB expects economic growth in China to be around 5% this year, with consumption being the main driving force. How do you view the potential of China's consumption recovery in 2023? The main engine of this growth,、uh, we see that as consumption-driven growth, and sectors that would be contributing to this would be、um, coming from service sectors, because this consumption um, growth. Um, Is due to the removal of the COVID-related mobility restrictions, and、um, so we expect that sectors such as、uh, accommodations, transportation,、um, travel-related、uh, sectors、uh, would be the drivers of this growth. Last year, China's foreign trade achieved steady growth. Do you think there will be a substantial pickup in imports and exports this year? On the external side. Uh, there are mainly two drivers、uh, on this one. On the exports, it will still grow, but、uh, it will be slower growth. This is because、uh, there will be、um, weaker demand from the advanced economies. They are expected to grow much、uh, slowly this year. That's number one.、Uh, number two, on the import side, we expect to see import to grow faster. This year, this is because,、uh, as as we discussed,、uh, we expect to see、um, household consumption growth this year, so that will drive the imports. Also,、um, once country opened up the international borders, if we see、um, a surge in international travels. That will also contribute to this. Talking about consumption, in recent years the keyword of openness has maintained and changed, reflecting China's commitment to share market opportunities with the world. So, how has China's opening up helped global economic recovery, and what are the opportunities it has created for other countries? So, China's、uh, reopening and recovery this year is a bright spot, particularly for those countries which has a close tie, close trade tie, with China. For example, say ASEAN countries, they will definitely benefit from higher demand for、uh, imports from the BRC. One area that China can strengthen the cooperation further is the climate change. For example, trade agreements among the region can be useful. That promoting trade facilitation measures in the region can help reduce carbon emissions by increasing transparency. Simplifying customs procedures by improving border agency coordination and shortening delays at borders. China's top energy officials have explained the country's energy strategy while meeting growing industrial demand and moving towards carbon neutrality. Our reporter Yang Chengxi reports. China's top energy officials say, as the country's industries rebound in 2023, energy use has seen a noticeable increase. The director of the National Energy Administration, Zhang Jianhua, said, "Going forward, China will make sure that while fossil fuel like coal would be the bedrock for energy security, the country will increase the supply of wind, solar, water, nuclear, and hydrogen energies." 
We will make efforts to realize that in the next five years, the proportion of non-fossil energy consumption will increase by an average of one percentage point per year. By 2035, 80 percent of the new electricity will come from non-fossil energy generation. By the middle of this century, non-fossil energy will become the main source. Officials say efforts are also being made to transmit renewable energy throughout the country. On principle, it is required that renewable energy transmission channels constitute no less than 50 percent of all newly constructed transmission infrastructures. We will accelerate the development of distributed energy, coastal nuclear power, and offshore wind power to achieve the dual development of energy from both afar and nearby sources. Another important measure is to utilize the power of the market by promoting and regulating the carbon trading and green electricity markets in China, creating incentives for industries to go green. Yang Chengxi, CGTN, Beijing. And now let's take a look at what else is making headlines in the business arena. China's Ministry of Commerce has announced an investigation into alleged restrictive trade measures imposed by the Taiwan region against imports from the Chinese mainland. The probe will last for six months until October the 12th and could be extended for another three months. Energy giant Sinopec has signed a definitive partnership agreement with Qatar Energy over the Northfield East expansion project. The project is the largest of its kind in the history of the LNG industry. Elsewhere in Asia, the Philippines has already deposited its instrument of ratification of the RCEP agreement to the Secretary General of ASEAN on April the 3rd. But a mega trade deal would not take effect for the country until June the 2nd, or 60 days after the deposit. And with that, I'm closing out this edition of Global Business here on CGTN. Thanks for being with us. I'm Lily Liu in Beijing. Till next time, bye for now.